The United Nations tries to restore a cessation of hostilities in Syria after more than 250 people are killed over the last two weeks in the northern city of Aleppo. Hello, I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. Diplomatic efforts are underway to help relieve one of Syria's most beleaguered cities. After Syrian forces declared a so-called regime of calm on Friday, diplomats have been negotiating to include Aleppo in the proposed lull in fighting. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry joined dignitaries in Geneva on Monday, and U.N. envoy to Syria, Stefan de Mistura, met with the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in Moscow on Tuesday. The talks come as more people are killed and injured Tuesday in a rocket attack on another hospital in Aleppo. This follows the airstrike on a hospital run by Doctors Without Borders that killed one of the city's last remaining pediatricians. We begin with CCTV's Roy Ruttenberg, who reports on that attack. The closed-circuit footage from inside Al-Quds Hospital in Aleppo, Syria, showed a relative calm last week. And then this. At least 50 people are believed to have been killed in the strike, among them children and medical staff. Western governments quickly blamed Syrian forces. Damascus denied its warplanes targeted the hospital in the rebel-held district of the divided city. Government-held areas in the west of Aleppo have also come under attack, leaving dozens more dead. It's estimated some 250 civilians have been killed just in the last 10 days. Aleppo has been the epicenter of an escalation of violence that has undermined UN-led peace talks in recent weeks. A previous agreement between the various sides reached in February has unraveled, and fighting has resumed on a number of fronts. Thousands of kilometers away in Switzerland, there were renewed calls for a diplomatic solution. Both sides, the opposition and the regime, have contributed to this chaos. And we are working over these next hours intensely in order to try to restore the cessation of hostilities and at the same time to raise the level of, of accountability that will accompany the day-to-day -day process of implementing this ceasefire. The UN's top envoy for Syria was in Moscow on Tuesday, trying to get the Russians on board. I'm looking forward to having now a serious discussion with one aspect that is clearly in my mind at the moment. We need to make sure that the cessation of hostilities is brought back on track. The cooperation between the military is developing. The military of the two countries are in daily contact, and this cooperation, which now happens via video conferences, will become direct, as in the upcoming days, in Geneva, a joint Russian-American Center for Response to Ceasefire Regime Violations will be established. Aleppo is seen as a key component to any new peace deal. Syria and Russia say they are targeting al-Nusra Front fighters. The al-Qaeda affiliate was left out of previous agreements. Assad's critics, though, say his forces are striking civilians. Many in Aleppo are now asking, where are the Americans? The Free Syrian Army, one of the rebel groups backed by the U.S., has nearly 1,500 fighters inside the city. Meanwhile, U.S. President Barack Obama has ruled out so-called safe zones for civilians in rebel-held areas as impractical. But as he announced last week, the U.S. is sending 250 additional American military personnel to support the fight in Syria against ISIL or Daesh, an enemy he and the Syrian president share in common. Rowie Ruttenberg, CCTV in Washington. Joining us now from New York is Stephen O'Brien. He's the United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Mr. O'Brien, thanks for joining us. Hello. We've just been listening to that report of that hospital being hit in Syria, the pediatric hospital, uh, killing many, many people. Now we get news of another hospital being hit in Aleppo. Uh, what do you know about this latest attack? 
Well, the latest attack in Aleppo that I have heard about is a hospital in western Aleppo where uh, we have heard that three people have uh, sadly lost their lives and um, about 15 uh, injured. But, of course, we wait to receive confirmation whether those are the uh, actual number who suffered from this dreadful attack. We condemn all attacks on all medical facilities. Of course, if there was no violence, we wouldn't have this problem, but there is a continuing uh, breach of the cessation of hostilities, and that is absolutely appalling for the people concerned, not least the people who are giving enormous service to those in need for medical treatments and injuries, and it is absolutely shameful uh, that uh, these acts have happened because we know it's totally in breach of all human rights and in breach of all humanitarian uh, law and norms. So it's critical that we uh, recognize the effort that is made to try and bring the parties together uh, to, under a cessation of hostilities, uh, to try and work out uh, through dialogue a political solution. The only answer uh, to the terrible suffering that's going on in Syria uh, is a political solution. There will never be a humanitarian solution. We are there to try and meet the needs, the humanitarian needs of people uh, who are being made to suffer terribly over such a long period of time through this uh, crisis in Syria. What is the humanitarian situation in the city of Aleppo right now? It's dire. Uh, we've had reports of attacks and violence, uh, both from airstrikes and uh, ground shelling. Uh, both in western and in eastern Aleppo. The, as you know, the uh, city, the uh, largest area of population uh, in Syria, has been uh, subject to a continuing fight across uh, lines and factions, uh, and there are a continuing number of uh, very serious outbreaks of violence in breach of the cessation of hostilities. So uh, the humanitarian situation, whether it is to do with protection of uh, innocent civilians caught up, whether it's women, children, uh, young men, uh, the elderly, uh, all are uh, subject to the most terrible violence and we need to find a way of making sure they have enough shelter, protection, uh, water, food and access to medical treatment. Uh, when you say you need to make sure that people get access to the basics, things like food, water, shelter, health care, uh, are there UN convoys going through? Are they able to get through right now? Well, of course, we are negotiating day and night, month in, month out, to uh, make sure we have safe, unimpeded access to try and meet the humanitarian needs wherever they arise, whoever has those needs, and for whatever reason they have uh, occurred. And so those negotiations continue. We put in the requests uh, to the Syrian government to make sure that we can get through the various checkpoints to put the convoys together, to load them up with the necessary humanitarian supplies. We try to make sure that the medical kits and the medical uh, commodities are not removed from those convoys before we set off. Uh, we are making progress in the month of uh, April. We have managed uh, to uh, get through to a number of the uh, areas which have previously been besieged since the beginning of the year. Uh, the UN and its uh, partners in the convoys, whether that's the ICRC, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent and the UN itself, have been getting convoys through to Rastan, to the four towns, uh, such as uh, Foya and Kafre, um, Gabadani, and making sure that we get uh, a coverage of about uh, something like uh, just under half a million people have been reached in the hard-to-reach areas, about a quarter of a million in the besieged areas where it's been very difficult to get access, and about 50,000 going across uh, the lines. So that's been uh, important progress, but compared to the scale of need, uh, that is still uh, woefully insufficient, and we know that we need to be able to get through more, but it does depend on being given safe, unimpeded access, which is absolutely what humanitarians have a right to, do, to demand, and we call for every day. And that's why we have all these negotiations with those who man the checkpoints, and we need to make sure we can get through safely. Now, Mr. O'Brien, as you've been pointing out, a political solution is vital to resolve this crisis. The UN Special Envoy for Syria, Stefan de Mistura, has been holding talks in Moscow with Russian officials there. Uh, I want you to take a listen to some of what he said. Let's watch. 
If, uh, as we all hope, there will be some type of confirmation that uh, even Aleppo will be returning into a cessation of hostility status, then uh, what could imagine all of us is that meanwhile we will be restarting and uh, pushing also for the humanitarian access and for the intra-Syrian talks. Everything is connected. Nothing is a condition, but everything is connected. So there was Mr. Stefan de Mistura laying it all out there. He also said that May, the month of May, is going to be very important for Syria. What should we be looking for in this month? Well, we want to see the cessation of hostilities hold and not be violated. We need to see Aleppo uh, join that cessation of hostilities. Of course, uh, any announcement about that, which we are told could be imminent, is hugely welcome. As the Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura uh, just said, uh, everything is connected in the sense that if you have a cessation of hostilities, when you have these negotiations to make sure that convoys loaded with the necessary humanitarian supplies can get across the various checkpoints and into the various besieged and hard to reach areas, these checkpoints will be numerous and they'll be manned by different factions, so you have to have negotiations with everybody. But the point about a cessation of hostilities is it not only gives the space for those who want to conduct political talks the chance to be able to get those started and to pursue them, but it also gives the people on the ground, the people who are affected by this crisis, the people whom we should have uppermost in our mind and whose interests we should be seeking to protect at all times, they have greater confidence that the plans that we have to get permission to get the convoys through to supply people with great needs for food, water, shelter, medical treatments, those uh, are going to more likely take place and to hold. So as I say, there isn't a conditionality, but there certainly is a connection because it is all about people having the confidence that they can rely upon the sort of agreements that are being achieved in order to get the supplies through. That's why this is all so important and it's also why there is a genuine need to find a way of getting a political dialogue going and so everything we do is in support of and very much uh, at one with the Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura and the talks and the particular parties who have influence on the other parties making sure that all comes together but at the same time uh, we as the humanitarians to get the supplies through we need to make sure that we are delivering as best we can with good negotiations that get us that safe unimpeded access so the truck drivers can get into their cabs with fully loaded trucks and get the supplies to the people who need it whether of whatever type of needs they have and indeed then to evacuate people from besieged and hard to reach areas who have medical treatments whether they're long term or recovering from injuries to get the necessary treatment that they need in order to preserve life to help people be protected and to give them the chance going forward of hope something which has been robbed from them now for a protracted period of time and it is our job as humanitarians uh, to do everything we can uh, to give the people of Syria that future hope. Okay sir, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us. That was United Nations Under Secretary General Stephen O'Brien talking to us. Next we'll speak with a Syrian journalist and a Syrian scholar about what it will take to end the five year civil war. Stay with us, you're watching The Heat. Welcome back to The Heat. The United Nations envoy for Syria traveled to Moscow on Tuesday in an effort to extend a cessation in hostilities to the northern Syrian city of Aleppo. Government airstrikes and rebel shelling have killed hundreds of civilians in the past week, and on Tuesday another hospital was destroyed in a rocket attack. Joining us now from Damascus is Mohammed Ali. He's a Syria-based journalist who's covered the war and politics in the region since 2005. Also with us from Los Angeles is Majid Rafizadeh. He's a political scientist and the president of the International American Council on the Middle East. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Let's go to Damascus first and Muhammad Ali. As I just said, another hospital in Aleppo hit, several people killed and lots more injured. Has the ceasefire or cessation of hostilities as it's being called completely broken down? 
Well, uh, not officially, but uh, according to developments on the ground, over seven days of intensive shelling uh, by uh, militants uh, inside Aleppo of government-held uh, uh, areas, this is definitely uh, uh, signaling that the cessation of hostilities deal in Aleppo in particular uh, has collapsed uh, eventually. Now, today there was uh, a huge escalation of violence. Uh, militants have organized uh, uh, a very uh, a huge attack offensive on Syrian government uh, 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 arm and army positions, uh, particularly in the western part of Aleppo. Uh, according to the general command of the Syrian army and armed forces statement just today, it said that uh, the al-Nusra front, along with Jaysh al-Islam, Ahrar al-Sham, and other smaller terrorist groups, have joined forces and attacked uh, the Syrian uh, army posts uh, west uh, of Aleppo. This is definitely signaling that the cessation of hostilities deal uh, 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 for sure collapsed uh, in Aleppo, and we are uh, hearing about talks happening right now on the international level uh, to perhaps uh, uh, restore calm to the city, implement a kind of a regime of calm uh, or cessation of violence or uh, a ceasefire, whatever uh, you name it, uh, the uh, aim uh, uh, which uh, Russia and the United States are working for uh, seems to be uh, how to restore uh, calm to Aleppo due to the violence taking place. And regarding the hospital you mentioned, yes, it is named Al Bayt Hospital. It is in a government held uh, residential area called uh, Al Muhafaza. 17 people were killed and dozens were injured as a result of a, a terrorist uh, uh, rocket attack on it. Right, Majid, as Mohammed uh, has been telling us, these high level meetings have been taking place in Moscow right now. The UN Special Envoy is there, is having talks with the Russian Foreign Minister. Uh, the Special Envoy is also talking about a transitional government and elections. Is this going to happen? Is, are you optimistic that this will happen, given the level of violence that's still taking place in that part of the country? Uh, that's a good question, Donny. You know, they, they've been discussing this transitional government for several years, and uh, I don't think it's uh, realistic uh, because uh, uh, I think the political gap between pro-asset group and anti-asset groups is uh, very deep to, to, to bridge. Um, pro-asset uh, allies is still like Iran and, 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 and to some extent Russia, they're still not ready to see uh, assets step aside and um, um, create a, a, a new democratic government. Uh, uh, based on democratic elections uh, and uh, I think that on the other side um, uh, the, the US and Western allies and other Arab countries in the Gulf they 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 demand that as steps aside before any kind of transitional government uh, uh, occurs so uh, so I think as you see like the political gap I think between two sides is too deep so it's less likely that um, uh, we will have we will see any kind of transitional legitimate transition transitional government which will satisfy everyone uh, on, on, on the table. So if, as you say, that political gap is too wide, Majid, what's next? What happens? Does this war just continue? Yeah, well, the, it's uh, unfortunately yes. I think this is. Um, I, I, I think this is. I make analogy between the Syrian civil war to some extent, like the Lebanese one, which went for for many years. You might see uh, some uh, short-term ceasefire held beca uh, because it's beneficial for both the rebel groups or Assad group. They want to reorganize. They want to 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 equip. Uh, but then these ceasefires are not going to be sustainable. They get, they're going to to, to break out. So uh, more like. Um, um, because of the uh, uh, the complexity of the of the war in Syria, the conflict, uh, which is not it's not only one war. You have several wars occurring at the same times. You have the regional cold war. You have the, the international state uh, stalemate. You have different countries uh, as, as, uh, sponsoring and funding and um, and arming uh, different groups inside the country. So you, what you have in Syria is 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 the uh, uh, largest pr uh, regional and international proxy battleground in the world. So it's it's uh, this kind of this kind of proxy battleground when it become regional and global, it's less likely to 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 be resolved uh, uh, anytime uh, anytime soon. Majid, part of this agreement uh, talks about a transitional government, talks about new elections, uh, as I mentioned. Is the Syrian government, President Bashar al-Assad in particular, going to agree to this? Well, his action shows no. Uh, he already held uh, uh, before the, the, the peace the negotiation talks. He, uh, there, there were parliamentary elections, and he wanted to project the picture that he is a legitimate uh, uh, president, and the parliament is a legitimate uh, representative of the 
uh, of the Syrian people. So, okay. um, and, uh, and if you listen I mean, to his speeches, he, he, he definitely believes that he is the legitimate leader of Syria. So uh, I don't think uh, uh, you're going to see fundamental changes in the political All right, structure. Let me get Mohammed's view on this. Mohammed, is the Syrian government going to agree to that? New elections, a transitional government. Well, uh, if we look back to what President Bashar al-Assad said in his latest interview uh, with a uh, Russian media outlet, uh, he was asked about uh, uh, the Syrian understanding of uh, the meaning of a transitional process. Now, uh, the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad uh, pointed out that a transitional uh, political process for the Syrian government uh, only means uh, uh, a new constitution uh, and also new elections inside the country if the Syrians agree to, which means in, in the end, that the Syrian government is definitely uh, 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 not going to uh, discuss uh, uh, handing over power to any kind uh, of Syrian uh, opposition group, whether in Geneva or in any other place. Uh, uh, the Syrian government believes that only elections inside the country, uh, uh, with the Syrians themselves deciding who their president is, how their constitution uh, should be, and all other political issues. So definitely, I don't see that uh, uh, Geneva talks will be uh, having any successful uh, uh, results in the end because uh, the uh, so-called uh, uh, HNC, uh, 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 the Higher Negotiations Committee out of uh, uh, Riyadh, uh, coming out of Riyadh, uh, 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 believe that, believes that this, this committee believes that it is going to Geneva uh, to take uh, uh, power, to take the authority, to take the presidential seat in Syria, while the Syrian government uh, says that it will not and never discuss such an issue in Geneva, only uh, 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 perhaps a, a government in new uh, government could be formed which would include opposition figures for sure however the president uh, the president's seat and also the constitution is something that the Syrians themselves inside the country uh, should be deciding so the president president Bashar al-Assad himself has ruled out any likelihood that he's going to step down as some parties to this agreement are calling for well, the, the Syrian president said it, and he was very clear that only the Syrians should be electing uh, and choosing who the president uh, is. Not Saudi Arabia, not Russia, not the United States, not any other country or group. It is only, uh, it is an exclusive right for the Syrian people uh, here uh, across uh, the country. So definitely, the president, I mean, the, the, entire, the entire war in Syria, the entire fight is for the independence of the Syrians' decisions. It's for the sovereignty and unity of Syria, for sure now, after five years of steadfastness. Uh, by the Syrian uh, army, by Syrian armed groups on the ground, by the Syrian leadership, by the government, definitely after five years, and they are still standing on their feet here, the Syrian army, they will definitely not hand over power and they will continue defending the independence of the Syrians' decision and the independence of Syria's decision in the, in, in the end. Okay, Majid, while all of this is going on, of course, a humanitarian catastrophe is unfolding in Syria right now. Uh, yet there doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency on the part of some of the major powers in the world to get this resolved, to ease the suffering of the people in Syria. The United States says that it's sending in an additional 250 troops. That's 250. Is that going to do it? Is that going to solve anything on the ground? No, definitely it's not going to, to, to solve anything on the ground. And I think the more uh, one country is uh, increase its uh, uh, military assistance to, to some groups inside Syria, then other sides also will, will do the same. And then you have more militarization and radicalization um, uh, of the conflict. Unfortunately, I think when different governments look at the Syrian conflict, they look at it from a uh, uh, more military pers perspective, and they think that the resolution is going to be uh, um, uh, the fra more um, um, uh, involving different kind of um, uh, the financing and arming and training uh, uh, different groups, uh, and I think that's uh, that's the predominant uh, perspective now. How they look at the uh, the, the Syrian um, uh, conflict. I mean, there are still some um, organizations that they are doing humanitarian aid. We shouldn't ignore them. Um, uh, they they're helping Syrian people, but I think when you have such a, um, a crisis in su su such a, I think. A, a big extent I think it's it's very difficult to to reach uh, everyone and, and in inside Syria and again um, um, uh, 
when you know when there is a conflict inside a country, usually um, a regional countries or or global power uh, look at it from more political opportunistic uh, uh, prism. Uh, you you have to you, you they will start to direct the, the the conflict in a way that they will preserve their own geopolitical interests. And I think this is uh, this is this is uh, this is done by every country. There is uh, um, um, I think the, there is no exception here. So they they will try to direct it in a way that it can preserve their geopolitical uh, interest. But when th when we have uh, 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 different groups, opposite groups uh, uh, in this conflict, then that I think going to uh, increase the, um, uh, the 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 severity and the longevity of the of the conflict. And I have to add uh, just one comment um, about the, uh, uh, what your guest said about the Syrian people. Uh, I I would like to ask him who. who 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 does he mean by Syrian people? Because uh, when I talk to people, I mean there are different areas inside Syria that are controlled by uh, by different uh, groups. It's hard really to uh, to 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 def to let uh, I think Syrian people in, uh, to 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 choose who they want. I think uh, there are yes some there are yes some areas which are controlled by Assad and those areas um, uh, still. Oh, right. um, uh, people live in fear, so uh, it's it's really hard to say we should let the Syrian people uh, right. decide. Okay, I, okay. Mo uh, Mohammed, uh, Majid has a point there. It'll be very difficult to get an accurate reflection of Syrian opinion of uh, you know the Syrian choice because large parts of the country are not under the control of the government right now, are they? Well, uh, I definitely agree that you cannot get all of the Syrians, 100% uh, of the Syrians' uh, opinion if you make elections. But let's take into consideration that uh, there are large parts uh, uh, that are controlled by the Syrian government. Homs entirely controlled except for about 3% of it, al -Wahr. You have Damascus and its countryside. Many of those are controlled by the uh, Syrian government. Tartus, Latakia, uh, Dara, al Sweden, all of those areas are controlled by the Syrian government. So we cannot say that uh, uh, the uh, uh, larger parts are controlled by uh, opposition groups. This is the first point. The second point, the Syrian government believes that terrorism will not stop it from carrying out political uh, uh, process across, across the country. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there was uh, uh, parliamentary elections across the country uh, recently. For sure, this is according to the constitution, it should be made. And definitely the Syrian government's message was that uh, terrorism across the country will not stop Syria from undertaking such measures and procedures political efforts, all kinds of efforts that could perhaps uh, uh, make a suitable ground for any kind of peace talks or, or right. a peaceful solution for the Syrian unrest. So yes, the Syrians can choose, they can decide, but definitely not all Syrians uh, can because of uh, the presence of terrorism. And let me also add just one point, which is that most of the civilians who are being able to get out of opposition controlled areas are rushing to the government held parts of the country and the government is actually giving them temporary shelter and all of their basic needs. This is according to what I have been covering on the ground and of what I have been seeing. I went to eastern al Ghouta, where the civilians were actually running away from the uh, uh, militant held areas due to the looting happening over there and due to the suffering inside those areas. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Muhammad Ali, Majid Rafizadeh, thanks to both of you for joining us. That is it for this edition of The Heat, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV underscore America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.